I'll be glad to see them in the house of God this evening. You may be seated. I'd gotten some hand sanitizer. So I was coming in the back, and I was telling how you guys do it, but, you know, I get it on my hands, and then I'm just kind of doing this, you know, because, and I, I come in, and people are, everybody's waving at me. I'm like, oh, hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> oh, hey. Just drying out my hand sanitizer. But. A few things to keep in mind. You know, we're not passing the offering plate, so you can continue to give online or through the app, or we have two give boxes at the back doors on your way out. Appreciate you guys helping continue to support the church in those manners. A couple of events coming up, both of them on the same day. On Saturday, July the 11th, 8 a.m., there's a men's breakfast here over in the Fellowship Hall. $10 uh, for the breakfast. Scott Smith, I believe, is going to be our speaker, right, Scott? You feeling it? Scott's going to bring the mail. Excited about that. And then that evening at 5 p.m. for the Center Point 50 Plus group, they're having a game night. For more details, you can see the Facebook group or talk to James or Delana Little. Man, wasn't God good to us on Sunday? So wonderful. I love when He just comes in and takes over. That's the best. That's just absolutely the best. I've been uh, working on and going to kick off a new series tonight. Um, I'm titling this, Can You Relate? And I'm hoping it makes sense as we, we move forward. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. And uh, this will be the uh, chapter we'll be in for the next few weeks as we go through this series. And for you that have studied the Word of God for a while, you know Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is what? Test. What's Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Sermon on the Mount, yes, the greatest sermon ever preached. We all have our favorite preachers, but it's hard to beat Jesus. So I'm just going to go ahead and warn you, you, better, you, know, you should just agree with me that this is the greatest sermon ever preached was in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, because it was. And Jesus was speaking to us, and in 7, he's kind of starting to bring it down to an end, the message. Um, sometimes when preachers, they, they talk about things like that, they say, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm I'm coming in for my landing, so Jesus was starting to come in for his landing on his message in chapter 7. So but he starts out the landing by saying this, chapter 7, verse number 1, Judge not that you be not judged. Probably outside of, uh, for God so loved the world, this is probably the most quoted verse ever in the Bible. Because, I mean, you can be Christian, non-Christian, people never been to church before, people never opened the Bible. Somehow they know Matthew 7, 1. <laughs> judge not that you be not judged. Verse number 2, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So, here's what we're going to kind of launch out tonight, and I hope I can lay a little groundwork that we can build on, because our goal is to ultimately get to what is referred to as the golden rule. It'll be kind of our crescendo and ending on this series. So tonight, this is going to be one of those messages where I make no guarantees about the content or the quality. But I do promise that when you leave the room, if somebody asks you at work tomorrow or at school what the message is about, you'll know what this message was about. So it's based off that very brief little passage right there. And it starts out by simply saying, Jesus' words, he says, judge not. Now, just to make sure that you guys all have it, can you just say that with me? What is the message about? Judge. Judge not. Now, that's pretty good, but I want us to do it again, but maybe this time you can help me out. Now, maybe you don't have a problem, you know, being judgmental, but, but maybe the person beside you does. Don't point, okay? But, but help me out. We're going to go one more time, all right, on this, but this time I want you to get your finger involved, right? You can have a little, all right, can you just do that with me? Because it brings a little more power to it. So just, just help. I don't have a little fun. Get your, everybody get your finger up. Get this finger. Okay, let me be specific. This one. Get your finger up. All right, and just kind of give a little wag. All right, and now what's the sermon about? Judge. Judge not. There we go. All right, I feel better about it. I think you guys are with me. I almost probably could just pray and dismiss right now. We got it. Oh, we, need, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. You know, it, it's funny, at least to me, that, that judge, being judgmental, it, it's kind of sneaky. It kind of slides in on, on you know, kind of a side door. You're not always aware that 
Maybe you're being judgmental. And, and I, hopefully I can unpack this and make it have a little bit more sense. But So here's another question. How many exceptions did Jesus give in this command? None. Yeah, good answer. There, there was no, you know. Did he, did, did he give a list or qualification of, of, of people who were exempt? You know, could it be their personality that, 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 drives, you, that drives you crazy? Or maybe it's the, their, their faults which run deep or their, their weird beliefs about things or the food they may eat or, or the, either their preference or political affiliation or their, their other issues or problems or... or Politics. It, it's, it's all this stuff. Did, did he give any of that, that 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 was listed as a possible disqualification for you not to judge? Did you read that anywhere? No, no, it was not one of them. No, he gave no exceptions. He made no loopholes. He didn't say, you know, if you're trying not to make a habit of judging, don't judge somebody else unless they really have it coming, and then of course you can go ahead and judge them. No, that, that, that wasn't there. You, you don't pick up on that. You know, in his kingdom, there's a zero tolerance policy about a judgmental spirit. In fact, Jesus actually got in trouble for his refusal to be judgmental towards people when the religious elite of the day felt like he should be. We see it there in Luke chapter 15, verse number 2. It reads this way, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. They were upset. They felt like you should have known who you're associating with and, and, and that knowledge should have disqualified them. But there you are. You're talking to them. Not only are you talking to them, but you're eating with them. We, we can sense here that Jesus was expected not to do those things. In fact, Jesus uniformly extended a very non-judgmental acceptance to, to a lot that people felt like he should. To the Ethnic rejects, to the religious heretics, to the pagans, to the Samaritans, to the sexually scandalous, to the corrupt, to the traitors, tax collectors, to the unclean, to the untouched lepers. To all of those, he would have a relationship with. He maintained his ability to be approachable. The only people that Jesus ever condemned, interestingly enough, were the religious leaders who condemned other people in the name of God. Those he condemned. The religious leaders who passed judgment, he says in Luke chapter 11, 39, he says, And the Lord said unto him, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Go down to verse 42. But woe unto you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and ruin every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. This you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe unto you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of these lawyers answered him and said, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us. Yet he made no apologies. He did not back up from the remarks he made. To me, there's a sense that he intended for it to hurt. For they ought to have known better. And yet they still acted the way they did. Jesus was so incredibly non judgmental with sinners of every kind except for them. His opposition to condemnation, we are told about in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Paul writing to the church at Rome says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So, how much condemnation? None. Zero. Not a bit. Now, this is wildly, in my opinion, misunderstood in the day and age in which we live in. Because Jesus' purpose in coming was to overthrow this, this spirit of condemnation. To save sinners. You and me. And to do so in such a way to show those who should know better how you should behave yourself, even if what the other one is doing is wrong. They had caused such a distance in their practice of the law that they had made it an impossibility to have the relationship with the one who gave the law. They made it so harsh, so unrealistic. They added to and enforced it so harshly 
that they took away all humanity out of the equation and boiled it down to simple black and white. Either you do it or your way. There was no grace, zero grace, zero leniency. Jesus came. He showed up and said, I've come to the sick. I've come to the hurt. I've come to the broken. I've come to the ones who have been rejected. I've come to let them know that you can have a relationship with God, that the kingdom of God is at hand, and that it's for all. All. He practiced and he refused to engage in judging. Instead, he offered this welcome acceptance at a great and ultimate personal cost. His teaching, as he's landing the message, is judge not. Therefore, the church must at least try their best to be a place where judgment doesn't reign. Christians, those who claim to follow after Jesus, to live their life according to His plan and purpose, must be the least judgmental people on the face of the planet based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. And if Christians are known for anything, we should be known for the fact that our love abounds. After all, I believe it was Jesus Christ himself who said, they shall know you are my disciples by the way you love. By the way you love. Now, I know some of you are getting ready to get the rock out of your purse because you feel like I'm going down the wrong path. Just hang on, put it back in your purse. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. How do people feel about the church? Now, here's the deal, okay? For a lot of us, I have to put myself in this category. For a lot of us, I've been in the church. I've been, been, I was born in the church. A few days after I was born, I was brought to the church. I was, I was here I mean, growing up. There was not an option in the house I lived in. that You, you came. To, we, their church was gone, and you went to church. If you're sick, we'll go to church and pray for you. If you're throwing up, the way you threw up, you feel better. Let's go to church. Like There was not an excuse. You didn't go to church. So I say that because I know there are several in the room that that was, that was the way you were raised too. Now, what happens is sometimes we, we are a little bit skewed in our view of the church because we've just been around the church. Now, we know, we will admit that the church is not perfect. You know why the church isn't perfect? Because human beings are in the church. And we're flawed, broken humanity. And, and, and if the church is messed up, it's because of us, you know. We, we do. We, we do our best we can, and there's been stuff that goes on and all that. But here, the, where I'm getting with this point is, there are those, though, who haven't always been around the church, or they've had a limited exposure experience to the church, or what time they were in the church, it was not a good experience at all. It was a hurt. It was a pain. It was a something that was there that's caused this, this, this huge mental, physical, emotional block that was there for them to get past. And, and oftentimes when the, the, the term church gets brought up, it's cast in a very negative light. Now, here we are. Not only are we in church, but we're in a, a, a narrowing down of the church. We're in an apostolic church. Not only are we in an apostolic church, we're in a one God, Jesus name, apostolic church. And not only that, narrow it down further, we're in a one God, Jesus name, apostolic church in the South. Okay? Now, that doesn't make us any better than anything else, but things are viewed differently. I'm not here to defend any of that. I'm just merely making a qualifying statement of where we are. So sometimes we can be just a little bit set inside of a bubble. And what we think is, well, everybody ought to want to go to church. When the larger opinion in the country in which we live in isn't the case. Oftentimes people who have had very negative experiences in the church, they view people, they view Christians as some of the most judgmental people that have ever put on shoes. Now, for you and I, we, we, we take a little bit back on that because we're like, well, hang on, that, that's not the church I go to. But they don't always break it down into a very narrow scope of an apostolic, one God, Jesus name, in the South church. They, 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 they put Christians in a lump. All Christians. They put us together. So sometimes we have something that we have to overcome when we're talking about it. But statistically, non-church people 
view churched people as very judgmental. Now, now here's the deal. There's a lot of truth to that. I'm not here to say that that's false because there's a lot of truth that goes to that because there's a lot of people who sit on church pews. There's a lot of people who sit on apostolic church pews. There's a lot of people who sit on apostolic one God, Jesus name, church pews in the South who are judgmental. Now, again, I know you're really itching to get that rock out. Give me a minute. Let me, let me show you what I feel like God has laid on my heart about this. People should feel safe when they come in the house of God. They should feel like if I tell you my struggle, you shouldn't hold it against me. Now, how many people are thankful that you came down to an altar and you were able to pour out and confess before a holy God and he remitted and washed away those sins? How many are thankful for that? I'm thankful. Maybe y'all didn't have stuff going on in your life, but I had a lot of mess in my life. And I'm thankful he took care of that stuff for me. All right? And I'm thankful also that I was a part of a church that helped love me. That, that was patient with me. I'm so thankful that I had a pastor in my life who was patient with me. Now, there was times I got called into his office. Several occasions I got called into his office and I, and I earned my way in each one of those times. And he had some real straightforward conversations with me. It wasn't about judgment. It was about consequences of the actions and decisions I made. But I was thankful that he loved me. And I was thankful that the church loved me. But it was done in a right way. But it's not always done in a right way. So it's, it's easy. It's easy for us to get in our little bubble and think they, well, they, they shouldn't lump us together as judgmental. But sometimes we have a lot to overcome to reach somebody. Remember the title of this, this series is Can You Relate? Have you ever been having a conversation with somebody around the water cooler or at work or whatever, and then all of a sudden the judgment comes up? Have you ever just been talking about somebody and, and, and said, you know, you really shouldn't do that? Are you judging me? No, I wasn't judging you. I was just trying to tell you probably you shouldn't do that. Well, you Christians, you all just think you're better than everybody else. That's the way it goes. And before you know it, it just spirals out of control. And then, then if, you, if you're not prepared for this, this can almost throw you backwards. Like, I don't even know if I should be a witness because it seems like anytime I try to be a witness, somebody brings this stuff up and I seem so ineffective in what I do and, and I feel defeated about it all. If you've ever been there, I'm, I'm reaching for you. Because he said, judge not. See, church should be a place where people can come in and, and, and more than their therapist, and more than their 12-step their program, and, 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 and more than their, their buddy at the bar, they should be able to come to the church and feel like nobody's going to judge me. I mean, you think about it, if you're meeting a stranger, you know, you're on a plane, you're on a bus, and whatever, you know, you look at them there, and you're, and you're making these snap decisions. I mean, they, they're drinking too much, they're... They got, you know, looked like they fell in a tackle box and pulled their head out and a lot of tattoos. And, and you're, you're there and, and, you, and you say, well, hey, how you doing? You know, hey, I'm a Christian. Do you think they're going to respond? Oh, thank goodness. I, I'm so glad I'm by a Christian right now. I thought I could have been by anybody else. They'd have judged me, but I know you won't judge me. What are the odds that's the conversation? Probably slim, right? So let's be honest, okay? Let's be honest. There's, there's, there's a good reason why sometimes there's apprehension in people being comfortable talking to Christians. We're not doing so good when it comes to being non-judgmental. I've heard, I've even heard Christians say, well, it's not about you know that that as much as, as, as those individuals. They're, they're just, they just don't want to hear the truth about where they are in life. Really? Really? What Kool-Aid are you drinking? It's funny to me, when I look at how Jesus reacted to those around him, his approach was, was, was radically different. He seemed to approach with love and compassion. 
He seemed to have a way about him that, that seemingly disarmed those people. When they were there, it's like the walls came down. They didn't put them up. Instead, they came down. Something about him. Something about what he exuded. Something about his presence. Something about the way he talked, his speech, how he reacted that caused people to feel very comfortable in his presence. Do we do that? Do we do that? Are non-Christian people comfortable being around you? Do they feel they're in the presence of someone who's not judging them? So here's the reality. Here's the truth. Not everybody was raised the way you were raised. And we got to be careful because, again, those of us, those of us whitewashed Bible thumping, apostolic, one God, Jesus name folks. We oftentimes have to check ourselves or we will look at what others are doing and we're like, what? You're an idiot. Why are you doing that? Why would you make that decision? You ought to, you ought to know better. Really? Do you know anything about them? Do you know anything about their life? Do you, do, does anybody even care that they're doing what they're doing? Have they ever had one person tell them you shouldn't live that way? Have they ever had one person ever even show them love? So be very careful about how you think about what somebody ought to do based off the circumstances in which you were raised. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the world we live in today is so broken and so fallen and is such a moral decline that statistically you're the abnormal, the abnormal one. You are, not them. My wife and I have this conversation all the time. We're, saying, We're crazy. I used to think everybody else was crazy, but there's so many of them out there, evidently I'm crazy. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We, we do that because that's the world. But, but our goal, our mission is to reach the world. It's to go and teach. It's to go out there and reach. It's to baptize them, to explain this whole process. But if we can't even approach them, if we can't have a conversation What does the world think about you? What does your coworkers think about you? What does your neighbors think about you? What is their opinion of you? Do you represent Jesus in such a way that they would feel comfortable letting the wall down and talking to you? So here's the message. It's really simple. What's this message about? All right, get the finger out again. We, we failed that one. What's the message about? Judge not. Judge not. We must abandon the deeply rooted practice of blaming and condemning other people, even ourselves. We're living in the last days. And there's so much to be learned by Jesus how he approached, how he lived, his message that he had, this Sermon on the Mount, is so impactful in our day and age, in our human history. It's all about people being messed up and, and the opportunity to realign our patterns and bring, come back into a right relationship with God. And you and I view this and understand the simplicity of it all, but the world doesn't. As we start this out, I want to start. We have to learn that condemnation is not to be about what we are. But we must be very careful because sometimes unknowingly, the way we look, talk, and act rains down condemnation on those around us. We have to be really clear. He was about judge not. So let me, let me say a little bit about what this text does not mean. First, it does not mean that we have to give up making moral discernments or being wise. Okay? If you go into your dentist, and the dentist, you know, you're in there, and, 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 and it comes in, looks in my mouth, and the dentist is like, well, you know what? 
pretty good. You need to be flossing more. You know, you got a little spot back here. It's probably going to turn into a cavity. And, uh, you know, this kind of lays it. All right, look, he's not judging. He's laying facts out. Right? Now, if he comes in and he's like, you know, I've seen better looking teeth on a comb. These things are like covered in butter. It's just disgusting. I don't even put my hand in your mouth. You, 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 I, you, I, just, it's just, I don't even have anybody even talks to you. All right, maybe you need a new dentist. Or maybe you really need to brush your teeth. I don't know. Something. Now, does this make sense? Like, there's a difference. There's a difference when, when someone is telling you the truth and when someone is, is, is beating you down. Okay? So that, Jesus wasn't saying get beat up about this. Okay, but sometimes you got to be true. You know, in, in our families and in our workplaces and our relationships, in, in our home life that we have, we have to discern right from wrong. We do. We, we, we have to train ourselves to hold people responsible for their actions, to discuss their failures, and, and sometimes you even assign penalties when it's appropriate, all while not attacking their self-worth. Okay? Learn how to do it in the right way. You, you cannot attack and, and forget that they are a human being and they deserve dignity. And in fact, and, and, and later on in, in Matthew chapter 7, he says that we should know them by the fruit they bear. Okay? So the very same chapter that starts off with judge not, we get about 20-something verses later, and he says you should know them individuals by the fruit they bear. Well, what's that about? I mean, it almost feels like you're judging when you're talking about the fruit. He's not talking about judgment. He's talking about being aware and discerning. It's obvious you have something going good in your life because of the fruit you're bearing. It's obviously something's wrong in your life by the fruit that you're bearing. This isn't me trying to tell you you're an idiot. This is me trying to tell you that something's not quite right because of the fruit you're bearing. And there's a difference. How you handle it. That goes back to learning to speak the truth in love. Because that's what the Word of God says. Jesus is not saying that in being non-judgmental, you have to be naive or gullible or, or, or like a little child. That's not what he's saying at all. Judge not does not mean you have to put up with being mistreated. People have crazy views on life. I got a friend of mine that... Uh, I say friend, is we went to high school together. And he's, he, he, he's a funny guy. He doesn't always post the most appropriate stuff on Facebook. He posted something the other day. He says, hey, if you really want to know, if your dog or your wife loves you more, lock them both in the closet when you leave for work. When you get back home, they even going to open up. And which one of them is happy to see you? That's the one that loves you the most. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's a test you should try. I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to do that. I would appreciate it if you wouldn't do that either so that we don't have to meet later. Or I don't have to preach a funeral. So that's not the idea, okay? That, that one's not going to work. The judging Jesus forbids means having a spirit of condemnation and rejection. It means... Indulging this desire I have to want to feel superior to everybody else. Because it's there. It's there. Turn to your neighbor and say it's there. It's there. You got it. I got it. It's in there. When someone's misdeeds gets punished, there's something in you that twinges a little bit. And you're like... Could have told you. Yeah. Sometimes there's something in you that's like, ah, ha, 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 ha. finally got you. I have been living obedient to the word of God. You, rank sinner, bound for hell, have not. God got you. Now, you may never admit it. But you know, you know, there's been a moment, you probably had at least one, when it felt good. 
judging people and their setbacks, judging people like that. You know, you, just, you have to be careful because we do it. We all judge. You know, it happens. It, before you even realize what you're doing, you're judging people. How many of you have been in line at Starbucks when somebody in front of you, they spoke another language when they ordered? They said something like, I want an iced Rosetto 10-shot venti with Brave, five pumps of vanilla, seven pumps of caramel, four Splendas on top with one extra one so it's crunchy on top of my whipped cream. And you're like, what? I just want black coffee. Non-soy, non-fat, non-fun, non-taste. And they pay $15 for that. And you're back there, you know, you know. Don't pretend you don't. Or you been there when they biggie size everything? And you're looking at them going, you look like a biggie size. You look like a biggie size. Been, you've been biggie sizing for a while. You know. None of us, none of us like that humility. Sometimes we, we like to remu remove the humanity side of the relationship. See, condemnation will cripple the other's soul. And it's intended to do that. We've been trained now in the kingdom of this earth to pass judgment as a way of trying to control other people and what it is they desire to do. You ever had somebody on the road beside you and you just look at them and you know you're being judged? They're condemning you, right? You just look at them and you're like, and they're just going, yeah, you know. Or maybe you're the one doing the glaring. So if judging is something the Bible generally and Jesus particularly forbids, if it's damaging other people and it corrodes our spirit, why would anybody do it? Why would, why would anybody judge? I think the basic reason we judge is simply this. And I hope you'll give me a second to explain it. All right, y'all ready? This is profound. Everybody you with me? Everybody with me? All right. You know why we do it? Because it's fun. Because it makes me feel good for a minute. Because in that moment, I feel better about myself. Because my judgment on them lets me know at least I'm not that bad. We're judgmental towards people we're jealous of because we're afraid they might actually be having more fun than we are having. And we don't like that. To me, one of the most unforgettable portraits of judgment in the Bible is the parable of the prodigal son. In this story, the prodigal son, we know how it goes. He basically wishes his dad was dead because he wants his inheritance before his dad passes away. His dad grants it to him. He goes off. He lives this crazy life. He runs out of money. He's slopping the pigs. He's so hungry he wants to eat the pig slop. And then he comes to himself. He has a moment where he's like, you know what, I'm going to go back. I'll just, my dad will just let me be a servant in the house. It's better than eating slop. I'll go back and be a servant. He comes back. His dad meets him. He comes along the way. He hugs him, kisses him, puts a robe on his back, a ring on his finger, and he throws a party, right? It's a great story. Hadn't got to the judgment part yet. The judgment part comes when Big Brother finds out what's happened. Yeah, this is what happened. His father's rejoicing, but the older brother's upset. And he says this in Luke 15, verse 29. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time. And, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you kill the fatted calf for him. I mean, it's a brilliant portrait of judging. First of all, notice he says, when this son. He didn't say when my brother comes back. Right? You, you see the, the, the power here? Love always identifies with. Judgment always puts distance between. Always. Your son, he comes home. Also, earlier in the story, Jesus never said anything about harlots. You ever notice that? 
There's not one word about Jesus and his part about the harlots. But all of a sudden, Big Brother says, you know what? He's been out there with a bunch of harlots. Where's this coming from? I don't have to explain harlot, right, y'all? Got that? Okay. Well, we got little ones in here. Let's make sure that everybody's getting the point. I'm afraid Big Brother felt like he was missing out. I think you see by his words that he thought he's out there having all these illicit relationships, doing everything he wants to do with whoever he wants to do it. And while he was doing all that, he's having all this fun. He's living it up. In my mind, that's fun. In my mind, that's living the high life. In my mind, that's doing the great and the grand. He's out there doing all those things. And, and I'm living too good to do any of that. I'm here obeying. I'm here being obedient. I'm here obeying the rules. And your son comes home and you throw him a party. To me, you can feel the judgment coming out of this because he's missing out on what he thought his younger brother was doing. When there's no record that that's what the younger brother was doing. Sometimes self-righteous Christians, and I can understand because I have that gear available if I want to use it, will just pretend we're above earthly pleasures and fleshly desires. That we're superior to all those things. And the reality is, at least for a season, ladies and gentlemen, sin is fun. That's why people do it. Greg Rochelle, he pastors, life church, author. His quote is simply this, if sin isn't fun, you're not doing it right. <laughs> now, that's not the Bible. That's not the word of God. That's one man's quote. But there's truth there. Sin starts out fun. That's why people do it. A lot of times religious people get self-righteous and judgmental because deep down inside they're afraid they're missing out on the good stuff. They're missing out on the fun. And when somebody else is doing it, we're like, I can't believe you'd be doing that. The truth of the matter is, but for the grace of God, you would be doing that. We judge because it makes us feel superior. Jesus invites us away from the kingdom of earth into the reality of the kingdom that he said was coming, one that was away from judging and condemning and blaming and feeling superior. So I feel like it's important as we start out this series on Can You Relate that we have to ask God to help us. Help me, God. Help me be an oasis of acceptance in a desert of condemnation. If you start where you live, how are you doing? It's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking for you to raise your hand. But how are you doing when it comes to being judgmental? With your friends, with your family, with your coworkers, with your church friends, with leadership in the church, how are you, how are you doing? Because here's the deal. When our spirit is wrong, it's easy to find the fault, and we'll talk more about this next week. It's easy to find the fault in everybody else. And never stop for a minute and really reflect, could I be the biggest part of this problem? If I'm always looking for why somebody is not doing everything they should be doing. They're not living up to the life they should be doing. It will make me a very bitter person person and I will get consumed in my own self-righteousness my superiority and from my perched seat I look down and condemn all no not verbally condemn them but through my actions through my talk how I relate all those things speak for me Here's the truth. You can't stop sinning by trying to stop sinning. You can't. And you can't stop being judgmental by trying hard to stop being judgmental. It's going to take God helping you. 
It's going to take asking God to replace that judgmental spirit that is living inside of you with a, with a reality-based, genuine acceptance that, God, I too am a sinner saved by grace. Not simply just mouthing those words, because those words don't cost you anything to say, but living a life every day that knows, but for the grace of God. But for the grace of God. That would be me. That would be me. There's a very powerful dynamic at work. And Jesus is teaching us this. As I'm getting ready to bring this, i got just about 10 minutes. That's just about enough to finish this. Very powerful dynamic. Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. To me, when I see this here, He's given us this general law, an understanding of the human condition. The law of reciprocity. That you tend to get what you give. Life often works out that way for us. If you give love, you tend to get love. If you get anger, then you tend to get anger. If you get distance, you tend to get distance. If you give sarcasm, you tend to... Get sarcasm. If you give joy, you get joy. If you tend to give it, you'll get back what you give. So what are you giving? What are you giving? The thing I ask you, both of those are on my desk. Would you go get them? What are you willing to give? And how are you willing to give it? Do you ever think about this? In your day in, day out relationships with individuals, with people, with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, that there's a correlation? I think most people understand it to a degree. But have you ever thought about your presentation of Jesus Christ? How are you displaying it? How are you showing it? How are you living it? Is it done in such a way because you've heard me say this before. This is not new and this is not my statement. I don't know who said it originally, but it wasn't me. But I like it. And here's the statement, simply this. Did you get the other one? Thank you. The statement is simply this. You may be the only Jesus they ever see. So I ask you again, how do you represent him? Jesus says, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So... I have this here. Does anybody know what this is? Any, anybody confused about this? If you are, we're going to judge you, and you need to see Pastor Michael, and he'll take you for a special lesson. No. This is a bucket. All right. Harder question. Harder because you can't hardly see it. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah. Not only is it a thimble, it's a pink thimble. Don't judge me. Thimble. So, let me ask you. You decide every day what measure you're going to use. How much encouragement you're going to use. How much love you're going to demonstrate. Do you give a bucket full of encouragement? Or are you to give a thimble full of encouragement? When it comes to love every day, do you give a bucket full of love? Or are you to give a thimble Full of love. Because Jesus said, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. There's a correlation here. So, even when you don't like the bucket for the person that's there, understand the bucket is what the gauge is or the thimble. What do you choose? How do you choose? Because they're tied together. Judge others as you want others to judge you. And we're going to get to the golden rule. We'll wrap the series up with that. But for now, how do you like being judged? Maybe, maybe I'll put it better this way. How much mercy do you want? You want a bucket full of mercy or a thimble full? Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you about me. 
I need the bucket. Because I know me. I know my life. I know what I deal with day in and day out. Therefore, understanding what Jesus was saying in this passage, in order for me to get my bucket of mercy, I got to be willing to give a bucket of mercy. When there are those individuals who have really pushed my buttons and tried my patience, I got to go back and remember I want the bucket of mercy. And if I want the bucket of mercy, I got to give the bucket of mercy. Now, I'm not saying, are you, t- are you heard me? I told you earlier, I'm not saying be a doormat. I'm not saying be abused. None of those things right there. No, no, not at all. But in my everyday relationships, my interactions with human beings, God always has a way of bringing special people to us, doesn't he? He just gift wraps them in the most unique ways. They stop by and they are just precious people. And when those precious people show up, oftentimes I have to go and think to myself, Lord, I need that bucket. I don't want to give my bucket, but I need the bucket. So help me learn how to love the way you love. Because what I don't want to be met back with is when I need a bucket and I get a thimble. We all have problems. We all have stories behind our life. You know, I got stories. We got to take everything into account. I can be judgmental. You know, I have, you know, things have been passed down to me through my family genes. You know, I have deficiencies and hidden pains. You know, remember I was raised in Wilson County. That ought to give me a little grace right there. My dog died when I was like 44. We all have stuff that happens to us. And all of it plays into who we are. Let us be mindful of those things because with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Tom Watson, CEO of IBM back in the 50s and 60s, he hired a young executive, brought him in, Executive was this hot shot was going in. He was doing good for a while until he made a $10 million mistake. In those days, $10 million was a lot of money. A lot of money to me now just talking about it, but especially for a company, $10 million in the 50s and 60s was a lot of money. He came back into Watson's office, the young executive did, with a letter of resignation to which Tom Watson received the letter, began to look at it, and the young executive said, I assume you're going to fire me, to which Watson replied, fire you? It just cost me $10 million to teach you something. I can't afford to fire you. Grace. Grace. After Peter denied Jesus three times, failed him at his moment of greatest need. When Jesus was on the shore that morning cooking breakfast, Peter went back to the only thing you know to do Jesus called him back out of that boat and looked at him and said, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. That beautiful moment, that special, intimate moment right there. Let me ask you something. How much do the words judge not mean to Peter? How much? How much do they mean to you that day, that night, that evening, wherever it was, when you fell down and you cried out for mercy and mercy met you? How much do those words judge not mean to you? Sometimes you need to be mindful and remember the moment when mercy met you at your greatest need, when someone who's pushing all the buttons you got and your temptation is to get the thimble out or to just write them off altogether. Maybe you need to go back and remember the night mercy washed over you. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. If you find yourself wondering because Christians do that, then how do I stand up without being self-righteous? You ask God to help you. 
You ask Him to help you. Ask Him to help you not be one who gives out condemnation. You ask Him to help you each and every day. My last verse as you all stand. Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to flesh but according to the Spirit. We don't receive condemnation from other people if you don't longer learn to let it in. It's a choice you make. For in Him, there's no condemnation. Now, we still have to receive feedback. You know, if, if your boss says to you, your work on this project was not satisfactory and it didn't work, you, you can't say, you may condemn my work, but the Bible says there's no, no condemnation in Jesus, therefore you cannot condemn me in this. You're probably going to get fired. Because <laughs> that's not what that verse is about. We still need feedback. We need critique. We need criticism and humility. But that's not condemnation. We're going to go deeper next week. We're going to look at maybe what is the most powerful prayer a human being can pray. But as we end this tonight, as we ask, how can we set aside all the judgment? How can we learn to offer love? As individuals, how, how can we, we learn to, to create an atmosphere where people can come into this church and they feel so much love and so much acceptance that every wall they've built up simply falls to the ground so that the love of God can reach them? See, we have a good church. We do. I'm so thankful for each and every one of you doing your part, but we can still go further. We can get to the point that the moment they pull in the parking lot, they just know this is home. This is home. Then when they walk in those doors, everybody's smiling. Everybody's got their hand out. Everybody's welcoming them. Why? Because we're not judging you on how you look. We're not judging you on, 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 on any kind of criteria other than the fact that you are a child of God. And here's a place where lives are put back together. And people can discover what it is that God has for them. If we get here, we begin to experience a new level of joy, peace, less worry, more encouraging. We become blessed, but we also become a blessing. Will you pray with me? God, I love you and I thank you for your word and the truth that is in your scriptures. For what you've shown us tonight, God, that we are not to be people who judge. We are the people who learn how to love. Let us know that with every measure that we give, it, we're going to receive it back to us. So let us be people who are patient and kind and long-suffering, who are willing to give buckets and not thimbles. Keep us, Lord Jesus, close to you so we can always see the open door you have for us. Let us strengthen the relationships we have. Let us tell everyone we know about you and the impact you've made in our life. In Jesus' name we pray and amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.